So, one of my all-time favorite video games is Persona 4 Golden. It's a game about a group of Japanese high schoolers living their lives in a small, nowhere town. Each one has their own personality, their own problems, anxieties, and charms. They also happen to be involved in a murder mystery where they're trying to figure out who is sending people into a mystery world which is accessed by going through a television screen. Bear with me, I promise I'm going somewhere with this. Even though the mystery drives the game's narrative and there's a substantial amount of combat in the game, the thing I love about it is the social aspects. It's an important part of it that rewards you for getting to know the characters in the protagonist's life, especially his close friends, and the closer you get to them, the more they reveal about themselves. Even though the game is admittedly problematic at times, something which can be chalked up to its age and the insensitivities towards marginalized groups in Japanese culture, it's all incredibly charming and an often pure experience. You get to spend time with friends, having fun, get into trouble, get involved in each other's lives, and reach out to those that feel like no one actually wants to listen to how they're feeling, or you accept people for being true to themselves. It's all just so wholesome. The first time I played Persona 4 Golden, I was quite young and arguably hadn't fully matured yet, but I loved it for all these reasons, and it found a very special place in my heart. Over a decade later, when it was remastered, I played through it again. I developed every relationship that I could, I listened to every word that they had to say, and immersed myself in the message that if you put yourself out there, if you try to listen to others, if you care, even if there's a possibility of experiencing pain along the way, it is absolutely worthwhile. At this point in my life though, I had grown and experienced much since my first time playing Persona 4 Golden. And because of this, by the time I'd finished the game, it broke my heart. Although these characters are fictional, their interactions and friendships made me reflect on a time in my life where I withdrew from the world. When I was a depressed teenager and saw little to no value in relationships and thought that getting closer to people would ultimately result in pain or disappointment. I was this child who thought that he had the world figured out, believed that there was no hope to be found in the future, and thought that this special brand of nihilism made me unique and wise. I had some justification for these feelings, sure, but now, looking back, all I see is a young man who squandered what could have been an amazing experience in his life, just feeling sorry for himself, who refused to reach out to others and slapped every hand away that reached out to him. There was no honour or pride to be found in the way that I used to believe. It's not good to live with regrets. I think I'll always regret spending this time of my life refusing to live and believing that getting close to others was just pointless. Being a Doomer is a waste of your life. Take it from an ex-Doomer. So let's say you're sitting at home one evening. You've got nothing to do, so you decide to fire up Netflix to watch Keeping Up With The Kardashians. Why? I don't know, but if that's what you're into, then you do you, I guess. You search for it, and oh no, it's not available on Netflix US, because even though the show is produced there, there's geo-restrictions in place thanks to the ridiculous studio system. Sure, you could watch it on Hulu, but that just means paying for another streaming service. Thankfully, Surfshark VPN is here to help. All you need to do is open up the app to see the thousands of different servers around the world available, click on the United Kingdom, be connected in a matter of seconds, and there you have it. You can now watch your trash television along with hundreds of more shows and movies that you don't have access to in your own country. It's not just for Netflix too, lots of streaming services either restrict some or all of their content in other countries, but Surfshark can unlock it all for you. It's also excellent for security too. Your ISP and lots of sites, especially the big ones, track your browsing habits and harvest personal information without you knowing, but Surfshark ensures that your online experience remains a private one. It also keeps you protected when using open Wi-Fi networks like in airports or coffee shops, so no one can take a peek at that weird fanfiction you're writing before it's finished. Oh, and it also works with iOS and Android devices, among many, many others. Use the promo code SOLARI to get 83% off plus an extra 3 months for free. They also offer a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk if you change your mind. Surf the web safely today. Link in the description.
All right, I I feel like this is going a bit too far, right? Like I, I'm trying to do a thing, but it it's a bit much, right? Yep, that's bad. I look like a goth going to a job interview. One moment. So some of you might not be familiar with the term Duma or what it is to be one. From what I just described, you might think it's just some form of depression or nihilism. And while those are part of being a Duma, it doesn't aptly describe the mindset as a whole. Doomers are essentially people who have given up on themselves, other people and the world at large. They can be alienated from the world around them, express great amounts of negativity, dismiss hope and purposefully isolate themselves from others, often resorting to talking to strangers on the internet to fill their quota for human interaction, but refraining from building actual friendships. Along with this though comes the feeling of hopelessness towards the world at large. Because of the looming threat of catastrophe and no solution in sight, Doomers commit to the idea that the world will inevitably come to an end, possibly in our lifetimes. And as a result, they end up feeling like they have no control, and all we can do is wait for it to happen, thus rendering their and everyone else's lives meaningless. And they believe that not enough people care enough, so therefore humanity is the architect of its own destruction, therefore deserving of its fate. Doomers not only have to contend with the idea of our imminent demise, but the conditions under which we live in what little time we have left, namely the conditions given to us under a capitalist framework. Most Doomers tend to be on the younger side, generally either Millennials or Gen Z with some Gen X, and as such they've been born into an era in which capitalism is at its most exploitative in history. And in many circumstances, it is borderline impossible for young people to survive financially, let alone amass any savings, given that at this point in time, we have less wealth than any generation before us. In the US in particular, millennials currently have less than 5% of all wealth, whereas by comparison, boomers have almost 60% of it. After being brought up and told over and over again that if they studied hard enough then they'd have a prosperous future, only to learn that the master's degree that they put all that time into and ended up in so much debt for resulted in a 42k a year salary, terrible health insurance, and an overpriced 700 square feet studio apartment that eats up half your paycheck each month. Understandably, some people are pretty bitter about this. I know I've been bitter. My wife and I have been looking for a house recently, and Jesus Christ, outside of the ridiculous cost, do you have any idea like how many ridiculous fees are just thrown out there and made up. Unfortunately, these aren't the kind of conditions that you can change overnight, and doomers believe that not enough people care to change them, putting them ironically in the same position as those that they criticize for not taking action. Outside of their own circumstances, there's also the fact that most people in the world are suffering due to circumstances beyond their control, suffering which people are getting louder about over time, while large media outlets opt to ignore it in favour of promoting the status quo, which, once again, has no interest in fixing systemic issues. We live in a society. Please don't clip that. That's incredibly hostile to those on the bottom runs of the ladder. And while it's not the case that all doomers are poor or working class, people in that position are more susceptible to despair because they have to live their life with constant anxieties about things like their finances or health or even whether they'll have an opportunity to climb that ladder or whether they'll have to spend their lives with their head just below the surface of the water, gasping for air. I should probably just stick with one metaphor and run with it. It also doesn't help that when you're terminally online, like younger generations are, they're constantly exposed to endless amounts of despair-inducing news and information. Wars, poverty, injustice, corruption, murder, violence, a pandemic that's now lasted for two f***ing years. Oh my god, can we be done with this already? And let's be honest here, seeing how people have reacted to this pandemic, especially in America, it's very easy to just think, okay, we gave this whole humanity thing a try and we failed. Let the virus take us all and we can hand off the planet to the monkeys. There's seemingly no escape from hopelessness. If you're a young person that wasn't born into much privilege, there are reminders everywhere you turn. It's definitely worth asking how any of us remain hopeful in such dire circumstances, because obviously not everyone gives into all this dread, but 
I believe I may have the answer to that, and I'll share that later on. When you're a young person who's thrust into an unfair, unrewarding world that's on the brink of destruction, I think it's fair to expect some cynicism from them. I know I felt it, and you probably have too. If you're a millennial like me, first of all, let me say that you should be commended for being resilient in these extremely difficult times. Secondly, I'd like to ask, how's that anxiety medication working out for you? Do you like it? Is it good? With the world and your life being held together by thin strips of duct tape and glue, coping with it is all very, very hard. You have to somehow find a balance between working or studying while trying to do everything else in your life. Paying bills, getting enough sleep, cleaning up, getting groceries, being healthy, staying beautiful, etc, etc. There's a lot of plates to keep spinning. Some do it better than others, but many people struggle, especially if you're someone like me who can't clean the bathroom without taking half a riddle in first. If you pair that need to balance your life with work and throw in all that existential dread about humanity and the dire economic circumstances, then suddenly you're spinning plates while juggling flaming torches. The torches in this situation being your mental health. With so much to carry on your shoulders, it can be hard for one person to manage, but Thankfully, many of us have people to turn to when it comes to helping with that. Unfortunately though, modern living conditions don't make it particularly easy to keep loved ones close to you, and it can be even harder to bring new people into your life, whether that be a partner or a friend, something I spoke about at length in this previous video. Isolation and alienation is becoming disturbingly common, and the difficulty of finding new friends in such a fractured social landscape has caused doomers to essentially give up on forming new bonds with people. The difficulty of finding friends or partners isn't the only issue with doomers though. Instead, it's the adoption of the attitude that actually making friends isn't worthwhile or even possible, and therefore it's best to accept loneliness. Finding friends can be especially difficult for people who suffer from mental illness, including depression and anxiety, among many others. Illnesses which can be caused by simply existing within our current system. As I said, there are a lot of aspects of life right now which are pretty bleak, so it is completely understandable that many people experience mental illness in some form, leaving them to either cope with it, or take medications, or even worse, pretend that it doesn't exist. Doomers have a tendency to fully accept their mental illness and seeing it as part of their life, which is honestly good, but in recent years there's been a harmful trend where illnesses such as depression have been romanticized and treated as sort of an aesthetic. Mental illness has had a long history of being stigmatized and ignored, so while it's good to see it being properly acknowledged as a genuine problem that needs to be addressed, it can be considerably harmful seeing it glamorized in the media, and especially social media. In the late 2010s, it became increasingly common to see memes about depression and anxiety on social media and sites like Tumblr, some offering light-hearted jokes about shared experiences, others making light about their feelings of ideation, which I won't be sharing here. Now, there's an argument to be had that sharing experiences like these and being able to joke about it is harmless and maybe even positive, and to an extent, that is correct. Seeing that there are others out there who are experiencing the same feelings as you can bring comfort and make you feel less alone. Which is great when you're suffering from an illness that by its very nature makes you feel alone. It's kind of like listening to sad music when you're feeling down, which if you can't tell, I tend to do a lot of that. Hence why you've heard a ton of Radiohead songs in my videos. And there's probably one playing right now if I'm honest. Yeah, see, don't tell YouTube. There is a big difference though between sharing experiences and romanticizing them, and media producers in particular have become keenly aware that depression as an aesthetic sells well among younger audiences. Music acts like Billie Eilish, 21 Pilots, The Chainsmokers, Lana Del Rey, and probably way more than I can remember, all present this image of themselves as being depressed young artists while intertwining it with their art and that visual appeal is internalized by many in their audiences, even among those who may not necessarily be depressed, but wish to express their identity through their music interests. Now, this isn't to say that artists such as the ones I mentioned should present themselves in a cheery, dishonest fashion, far from it. 
Like I said, it can be comforting to find something that you identify with. But if you look to the past at a band like Nirvana, specifically their frontman Kurt Cobain, he was disgusted by how the media sold him to the public on the back of his angst and ennui, thus commodifying the very serious mental health problems he experienced in his tragically short lifespan. Depression as an aesthetic encourages the idea that an illness such as depression should be embraced as part of a person's personality to create a sense of identity rather than something that's serious and should be addressed and treated. Doomers have essentially adopted this aesthetic wholesale, creating an image that lets the world know that they are a depressed person and that is how they're defined. As I said earlier, depression among other mental illnesses have had a long unfortunate history of being stigmatized by society and generally it's improved, sadly thanks to the fact that depression and anxiety are now an epidemic across the world. As someone who's had to endure these issues for years now and been very open about them, it's great to see it finally be acknowledged. It is undoubtedly part of my personality. I mean, if you've seen my other videos, you'll know that by now. But at the same time, it's not what defines me. There's telling those in your life that you are aware of your illness, and there's telling people that your illness is what defines you, and that's where doomers are making a misstep. Because if that's what defines you, what incentive does it give a person to get better if it means losing a large part of their identity? Where do you draw the line between being open and accepting of mental illness or letting it be how you present yourself to the world? It honestly pains me to see people not only submit to despair, but embrace it with open arms. People cannot be told to feel the way they feel or act like they don't feel, and I'm not suggesting this. Doomer's feelings are legitimate and need to be recognized, but there's a point where a person has to refuse to accept that nothing can be better and accept that the best option is to hide away from the world and just wait for the end to arrive. It's destructive and it's wasting precious time in people's lives. However, that's easier said than done, and believe me, I know. I truly hate seeing how the world has led people to this point, and one big reason for that is, well, I kinda used to be a doomer myself, and if you don't mind, I'd like to share my experiences, including what sent me down that path, what I did while I was on it, and how I found my way out. Welcome to the Boost Bus, the section of the video where I take a moment to encourage you to support other content creators who could do with a little more exposure. This time around, it's a bit of a special occasion since I'll be promoting two creators. Sorry for the lack of camera, the footage may or may not have been corrupted. It was. Firstly, I want to show you the work of Georgia, aka Seroloid, an illustrator and concept artist who is currently working on the indie game Mind Ransom. She's currently a student at the University of Lincoln in the UK, but also does commissions. As you can see, her artwork contains lots of stunning, vibrant colours that really emphasise the otherworldliness to her illustrations. And each of her character designs have unique stylistic quirks that helps each of them stand out, all based around the fantastical and the surreal. Georgia is currently accepting commissions, so visit her site, follow her socials, and maybe ask her to make you something. She's excellent at what she does. I've included links in the description, along with one to Mind Ransom's Twitter and website. Next up is Gears, an illustrator and comic book artist that hails from Mexico. She works with ink, watercolors, and paper, and everything I've seen by her on her socials and in my Discord server has been exceptional. Her flexibility is amazing, from medieval or fancy inspired pieces, architecture or anime and manga character pieces. Throughout all these different styles, she still manages to maintain a motif that is distinctly hers. She's also had a couple of mangas published by an indie printing house in Mexico and works with digital media. I encourage you to follow Gears on her socials and if you can, support her on Patreon, where she also does commissions for patrons. Once again, you'll find all the links in the description. Lastly, this is a personal choice but I'd quickly like to promote the YouTube channel Games as Lit. I love literary analysis, and although there's a fair bit of it on YouTube, some good, mostly bad, few people excel at it like the game professor. I recommend you check out his videos analyzing Final Fantasy VII and the cult classic Spec Ops The Line, but everything he's done is fantastic, and he doesn't get anywhere near the views he deserves. He also doesn't know I'm doing this, so tell him that you said hi from me. If you'd like a ride on the Boost Bus, then please send a single email to solarivideo at gmail.com. 
Be sure to include your pronouns, a brief bio about yourself and your work, and any relevant links, including socials. Also, please be sure to include high quality samples of your work so they can be used in the video. I won't be able to reply to your emails due to the volume, but rest assured, they are all being read. Okay. By the way, this isn't a spilling the tea metaphor or anything like that. I just wanted some tea. So if you've been following my work, you'll have noticed that I have an arguably morbid interest in loneliness and sadness. Just to be clear, I don't touch on these topics just to farm clicks from people who feel the same way. I do it because I've had my own personal experiences with them and during those times, I did a lot of reflecting on these topics, along with a lot of reading about it. I wanted to better understand how myself and other people end up in such a way, with hopes of possibly remedying things. I sank into depression the first time when I was about 15 years old. There was a ton of chaos going on in my life around that time, specifically in my family. It's a long story to get into, but it was enough to affect my young mind and contemplate whether there would ever be any brighter days ahead in my future. I also felt like I wasn't getting much attention from my parents just because of this chaos. And as a result, I started feeling like people didn't really care about me or my existence. When I turned 16, I went to college. You go to high school, college, then university in the UK, uh, all separate things. I went to an all boys high school, which might sound like it was a fancy private place, but no, it was just a regular free school. They're not common in the UK, but they still exist and they are awful. I ended up going to a mixed gender college and at this point in my life, I hadn't really interacted with many women. So I had this huge flood of anxiety, which made it difficult to adapt in this new environment. So I retreated a bit more, leaving me to feel uncomfortable at both home and school. Eventually, I was thankfully able to adapt thanks to the people at the school who reached out to me, despite the fact that most days I was wearing a dour expression on my face and t-shirts with Robert Smith from The Cure on them. I also encountered an early instance of life screwing me over, so to speak. I was expected to get all A's in my subjects, but the teacher told us the wrong time of our sociology exam, which a lot of our grade depended on. They wouldn't let us retake it for another six months, by which time we'd already be at university, so the choice was to either wait another year to take one exam or live with it. Everyone chose the latter, obviously. The exam was important enough that it bumped my sociology grade all the way down to a C from an A. Despite the situation, the university I applied to didn't care and rejected me. So because of someone else's mistake, the entire trajectory of my life was changed from that moment. And it was this stark lesson that taught me that even if you do everything right, something can come along and mess everything up, thus leaving me feeling insecure about my future and disheartened, to say the least. I ended up studying TV production at a university I didn't want to go to, but at this point, I just wanted a degree under my belt. The course was disappointing, and the department was poorly equipped to teach the subject. They had these nice, super expensive Avid editing suites, which sounds great, but it turns out that none of the tutors actually knew how to use them. And they told us that if we want to learn it, paying students... We have to come in during our spare time and figure it out. Which, if you know anything about Avid, that is a lot to ask. It's like putting ingredients in front of someone who's never baked and saying, make me a three-tier wedding cake with Swiss meringue buttercream and while you're at it, why don't you uh, whip up some macarons as well? Thanks. It was bullshit and just made me feel worse about the fact that I was where I was. By the time I was halfway through my degree, I desperately wanted to do something else, but I stuck with it because I didn't want to have wasted my time. And unlike countries like the US, you can't just transfer credits over. You have to start from scratch. At least the university I went to was like that. So if you want to switch, you lose all that time. So I put up with it and I've barely made use of the degree since. Well, until doing this, technically. It was also around that time that I started devouring philosophy books, and unsurprisingly, I took a bit of a shine to the nihilists like Nietzsche, Sartre, Baudrillard, and many, many others of the sad gang. And you 
better believe that I internalized that stuff. I embraced it with open arms, believed that life had no meaning, all of that stuff. Also, to be clear, I'm very aware that I have some level of privilege by being able to go through education like this, and some might argue that I shouldn't complain or that I'm whining because I didn't get what I want. There probably is some level of entitlement here, but it's the tapestry of disappointment, you know, from family life to the circumstances beyond my control, which contributed to just this huge, massive chaos. The next bit is what I think really set me on the path of being a doomer. The moment I was baptized in despair, if you want to get poetic. Around this point in my life, well, I met a woman. She understood me better than anyone else had in my life at that point and genuinely cared about me. She saw that I was going through a tough time and always listened when I needed to talk and I'd listen to her about her problems too. We talked for ages about everything. It was fun being around each other, and I missed her whenever she was away. Eventually, I realized I'm in love. Something which, in my depressed, lonely mind, I didn't even think I was capable of. But here it was, staring at me in the face, telling me the truth. There was a problem, though, and that was that she was in love with me, too. And she had a boyfriend, whom she was also in love with. I didn't say anything, no, I just wanted to enjoy being around her and hope that these feelings would eventually go away, but unfortunately, they didn't. One day, we were hanging out, just the two of us, and after a moment of silence, we looked into each other's eyes, lingered for a second, and without saying a word, we just both knew that the feeling was there for the both of us. You know like how they say that when you fall in love, you'll know it? Well, some cliches are kept alive for a reason. With that revelation, no, came the gigantic elephant in the room, and every room we'd be in from there on out would have that elephant. We felt the same way, but it couldn't happen. Oh, and to be clear as well, this this isn't like one of those situations where it's like, you know, ooh, no, the boyfriend's an asshole, I'm a nice guy, how come you're with him, assholes always win, blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff, yeah. No, it, it, it was a genuinely nice guy, I was friends with him, and, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to hurt his feelings too, so yeah, it's, it's not insult shit, if you were thinking of that. It could never be. I fell in love with the wrong person, and the wrong person fell in love with me. Unrequited love is one thing. Most of us have experienced that in some form. But not being able to be with another person that loves you back is a special kind of pain. To know there's a person out there who has all these feelings for you, and you have just as many for them, but you can't share them, is unbearable. Like, it kills you inside. And since this was my first time falling in love, it kind of taught me to be afraid of falling in love again. It's something that's supposed to be beautiful, and you just feel ugly from it. We eventually parted ways, life got in the way of things as they do, and I haven't seen her since, but the effect it had on me was devastating. I was already very disenfranchised with life in so many different ways, only to have love taken from you felt like the killing blow. It felt cruel in a way, and it also didn't help that I couldn't talk about it with anyone, because it was just too painful to do so at the time. It left this terrible wound that, in some way, I still have to this day. I'm married now to someone who I very much love, and those feelings for that person have long since gone. And to that person, I don't know if you watch my videos, but if you do, I hope you're doing well. It was also during these years that I learned my dad was diagnosed with thyroid cancer, so life was really laying it on thick at this point especially since all that other chaos that I mentioned previously was still present. He's fine now, though. It's under control. He's doing great. I'd also entered the workforce during this time, still heartbroken and depressed and worried about my dad and my family, but I had to get on with it. The first proper full-time job I ever got also ended up being the worst I've ever had. 60-hour weeks doing mind-numbing work for bosses who would fire people who were violently ill at their desk and had to leave early. I didn't really get along with anyone there, I felt out of place, undervalued, and entirely expendable. 
The job just took up so much of my life and I was so exhausted at the end of the day that each night I'd go home, watch some TV, maybe play a game, have dinner, go to bed, then do it all again a few hours later. I barely got in touch with friends, I had no partner, no social life, I loved playing music but I had no energy for it anymore and for all intents and purposes, I didn't exist. Now this part gets pretty dark and you probably know what I mean by that so if you need to, uh, here's a time code that you can skip to. Driving home from work one night, I was at the lowest of my lows. I had been hurt in so many ways and had no control over my life and felt I simply did not have a good future ahead of me, that the longer I lived, the more I would make myself susceptible to pain, and I wasn't sure how much more I could take. As I was on the highway late at night, it felt like a very, very long time, but it was probably just a few seconds, and before I knew it, there was a truck behind me that honked its horn and kept flashing its lights at me. Uh, it startled me, and yeah, it stopped me in my tracks right there. They probably thought I was asleep, yeah. But um, yeah, I pulled onto the shoulder of the highway and broke down in tears. I sobbed in a way that I never have, and haven't since then. Here I was, rock bottom. I wanted a way out, but it had been so long since I'd seen a ray of light that I didn't believe there ever would be one again. Eventually, I went on sick leave. Work was starting to make me physically ill from the stress. My boss got in touch after a couple months asking if I was going to come back. While I was telling them what I'd gone through, uh, they interrupted me and said, I don't care about any of that. I just need to know if you'll be back. Oh, and by the way, you'll be getting demoted. At which point, despite believing that I didn't have any self-worth, I knew that I shouldn't be spoken to like that. So I told them to go fuck themselves. Which, by the way, if you ever get the opportunity to say that to a boss, highly recommend it. It's super cathartic. Like, Mwah. God, this is way longer than I expected. Time passed. I tried to recuperate. I took up stand-up comedy as sort of a hobby since friends in the past had said that I'd be good at it. And I even ended up getting paid for it eventually. I kept it secret from my friends and family though. I didn't want them coming to a show and have them hear me talking crap about them. Sorry, mum. I also managed to start seeing a therapist as well, which at first I thought wasn't working out since the first few sessions I ended up leaving in tears and feeling like garbage afterwards. But that's just how the process works. You sometimes have to open the wound to treat the infection. I was taking action and started feeling better. But one day, one seemingly tiny and insignificant decision I made literally changed the course of my entire life. Around the time I was trying to get better, I was still pretty close off from the world around me. Uh, but one thing I enjoyed doing was playing competitive video games online. There was a game that was coming out that I wanted to play, but didn't have anyone to play it with. And since it was best played as a team, I didn't want to lone wolf it. So one day, for the first time in my life, I left a comment on a popular gaming website asking if anyone would like to play. Lo and behold, I got some responses. We added each other, started playing together almost every night, and became good friends. We learned each other's real names, connected via social media, all of that stuff. It was great finally having people to speak to and have fun with and not have to worry about all my baggage. They were all in North America and I was still in England at the time, so many nights it resulted in me staying awake until 3 or 4 a.m. playing and talking, but it was worth it. Through interacting with them on social media though, I one day got the attention of one of their friends who sent me a DM and later added me as a friend. We started talking more and more and that one DM led to hundreds of long DMs back and forth getting to know each other and soon enough we both realized that there was something there and one day she told me how she felt, something I'm glad she did because I never would have having been stung so badly in the past. Also, I'm horrible at telling when people are actually interested in me unless the truth comes out but... Yeah, it probably would have been lost on me. I had an idea, but you know. It was the real deal. 
we became a thing. I came to the US to see her and she came to the UK. And on one of my visits here, um, I proposed to her on the exact same spot where we met in the flesh for the first time, right next to the uh, luggage belt in the airport. After an ungodly amount of paperwork for the visa, I moved to the US and we got married. I've been here for a few years now. America sucks, but at least I get to be with the person I love. Just think of that for a moment. This one little action of posting a comment on the internet, asking people to play a video game with me, not only led to me finding some friends, but it led to me finding the woman that I ended up marrying. Not only just marrying, but moving across the world for them. Even to this day, it's just mind-boggling to comprehend how something so small, so innocuous, can change a person's life so drastically. But that's the point. But I'm here now. I'm with the person I love, and I'm doing this, for better or worse. I know this isn't the kind of conclusion that I usually make in these videos, and this is all very anecdotal and very personal, but I sincerely think it matters. I don't believe in luck. I think that people convince themselves that luck exists just to explain the chaos of the universe. But I think I'm living proof that if you take action, even small ones, it can lead to something bigger and better. Yes, there is a possibility that it can lead to something worse, but inaction will lead you nowhere. And although there's an odd comfort in living in sadness, in believing that if you don't move, then you won't be hurt, it's still worth taking the risk. You may not be able to change the state of the world by yourself, but you can contribute to a greater effort. You may feel alone, but you can find people. And just because you've had a few bad experiences doesn't mean that there's no one out there for you. It's a lot to ask of people, I know. Like I said, I've been there before. But you never know where the smallest of actions can lead. And after having learned that firsthand, I can say for certain that regardless of how insignificant an action may feel, great change can occur through the smallest of things. It kills me to think of all that time I spent wallowing in sadness, refusing to let people know that I existed, and reinforcing these ideas in my head that nothing had any meaning, all the while believing that I had the world figured out and believing that my sadness is what made me unique, and as such it was impossible to find another human being who would understand me. I had ample reasons to feel down, and do must do as well. It just pains me to think of all the bad vibes I brought with me when I spent time with friends. Friends who cared enough to stick around me despite everything. I wish I could have lived out those years just doing dumb things, making mistakes, staying out late with people I barely know, trying new things, getting a tattoo that I'd later regret, just living and making stories that I could share when I get older with a smile on my face. You know what the funny thing is? I mentioned earlier that I became a bit of a nihilist when I was at university, but guess what? I still kind of am. I still believe that life doesn't have any inherent meaning to it. Humans have consciousness, and as such, we like to come up with all sorts of ideas that validate our existence, but I think we're just here for no reason. We're an accident. It doesn't matter, though. You're alive. You don't have to prove anything. You don't have to prove that you belong here. You can just live and enjoy it. My favorite philosopher is Albert Camus, even though he didn't like being called a philosopher. He believed, like many other nihilists, that life has no inherent meaning to it. But what I like about him is that he said that because of this, you should still be happy with the fact that you simply exist, that there's joy to be found as long as you're willing to live and enjoy your fleeting time on this planet. I liked his writing so much that my wife and I even named one of our cats Camus. Here he is. He takes joy in chewing on window blinds and stepping on keyboards when they're being used. Also, I'm very aware that it's a very pretentious name, but I like it. I promise you that whoever you are, whatever situation you're in, living like a doomer is not at all worth it. All you're doing is harming yourself in the long run and denying yourself a life that you could be living. I know that it's tough, but take your time and try and build up even the smallest amount of strength to take action. You matter. You deserve better. And trust me when I say that you can have better.
Thank you very much for watching. If you did enjoy this video, then please don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. You know the drill by now. It all really helps. So. Um, I would also like to offer a big thank you to all the people who support me on Patreon. As you can see, their names right here. All wonderful people who chip in a little bit every single month to keep this project going. I super appreciate it. I'd also like to offer a special shout out to all of my patrons that donate $5 or more each month. And that goes to Catherine Pendel, Mimi, Praise Lord Gilgamesh, Nicholas McDonnell, Azul Crescent, Alicia Crawford, Saval Olufsen, Maurice Robert, Candide, Dan McCrary, Remy Allen, Daniel Perone, Anna Marie Hanyasova, Freeman Killer, Lizzie Peasy, Insula Sacra, Grant B, J, Jordan Christoph, Matthew Torres, Rach, Enrique Gutierrez, Murgurgur Fashionable, Alina, Ratams, Games, Martina, Sander Panda, CB Hart, Kevin Corber, Lillian Roan, Sharfay, Nostricon, Mickey Buonadonna, Sparrow Wagon, Tamara, Maria Stubberud. In response, I mental misstep your bolt. <laughs> your sweet pea, Catherine and Steve Ma. Thank you all so very much for donating. It does make a huge difference and everything goes back into making this channel better. And if you'd like to help as well, you can do so at patreon.com slash salari and chip in whatever amount you feel is right. It can even be a dollar. It all goes a very long way. Uh, you also get a bunch of bonuses too. So for example, you can get early access to new videos, usually a day before they're released without any ads. And also you can get script previews as well, where you get a couple of pages to read before the video comes out. And thank you very much for hearing my story as well. Like I know this was a very personal kind of video and I tried to be open about these things. And I hope that if it has touched you in some way, or if you identify it within some kind of way, I hope that it helps you. I've also included resources to various mental health places that can help you if you are experiencing problems or if you are in crisis. So please, if you are experiencing any of these issues, then don't hesitate to contact them. There is always help out there for you. Um, it may not feel like it, but there is. Also, if you wish, you can join our Discord server. There is a link in the description for it. Lots of wonderful people there, all very talkative, and I even appear there myself sometimes too. So yeah, feel free to join. It's a wonderful place. But otherwise, thank you very much for watching once again. Take care of yourselves, take care of each other. Be well, and I will see you next time, okay? Bye-bye.